God's holy word. A lamp into my feet and a light into my path. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's more powerful than any sharp two-edged sword. It's fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I'm ready now to receive it. Turn with me to uh, Amos chapter 6. One of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We call them minor prophets because their books are a little shorter, but they certainly have major me uh, messages as minor prophets. And the message of uh, Amos is that of complacency. That of complacency. So I titled this uh, a message, Crisis of Complacency. In verse 1 of chapter 6, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation, to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go down to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their, ter is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause a seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for themselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourself with best ointments but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore, they shall not now go captive as the first of the captives. And those who recline at banquets shall be removed. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob. I hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and it's all that is in it. Father God, thank you for your word. It's... It's stinging, it's startling, it's surprising, Lord, how you confront us where we are. And these old scriptures, thousands of years old, are so relevant, so contemporary as today's newspapers. And they hit us right where we are now in 2018. We pray, God, that we may hear from you today and that we may uh, be able to uh, revive and refresh our hearts before you today in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If you open your bulletin, you'll find an outline of today's message. And uh, let me just read a, a paragraph by one author who said, we don't need fasten your seatbelt signs in our pews because we no longer fly. We are like it a gaggle of geese attending meetings every Sunday where we talk about flying and then just get up and walk home. Soren Kierkegaard, uh, a Swedish theologian years ago said a similar thing. He said Sunday mornings in the Avery Church is like a group of geese flying in for a meeting. When one chief goose gets up and honks, and at the end of the meeting, they all go by and tell him how good he honked. <laughs> Maybe he didn't honk that good. That describes a very complacent, a very anemic kind of church. I believe the church in America today is a church that is complacent, a church that is indifferent to the things in our world. And Amos is a prophet who pe preaches against that indifference. He sounds a wake-up call to Israel. He preached in about 786 B.C. And if you'd like to see the, the uh, theme or the heart of his message, look in chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, the words of Amos in the days of Uzziah, who was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, the king of Israel, in verse 2, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from
from Jerusalem. Amos was a prophet in Judah, but he was prophesying against the northern kingdoms and Samaria was their capital. They had pretty much walked away from God and their uh, worship was nothing more than lip service to God. And so Amos is saying, God doesn't just whisper. He doesn't just shout. He doesn't just whine about your problems. He roars from Zion to sound a wake-up call. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up out of your slumber. Wake up out of your stupor. This is a time for you to hear what God has to say or you will face judgment and destruction. Now, I don't know how you wake up in the mornings. Uh, maybe a buzzer, maybe a bell. We used to use our radio clock. We don't use it anymore. One day, uh, you know, uh, we used to like to hear that soft music in the morning, and then I'd turn the old snooze button on Gerald, and he'd come back, and, and it'd be soft again. One day, Sharon was dusting and hit the volume button that went all the way up, hit the... Uh, other button and put it in between channels. And when that thing went off in the morning, the most awful sound, I never woke up like that in my life. God is, or Amos is saying, God wants us to wake up. And he roars. He roars. There are three wake-up calls in this uh, passage that I just read. And I'd like to share them with you because I think the church in America is complacent. I believe we're at a crisis of complacency where the church is so inept, so tippid, so lukewarm that it has very little to offer to our world. And we're just like a gaggle of geese coming in, talking about flying, and then we just get up and walk home. Nothing really happens. Let's talk about how that God wants to wake us up. The first wake-up call is this. It's attack on easy living. In verse 1, Amos says, Woe to you that are at ease in Zion. Woe means uh, that you are, you are to be uh, excited, you are to be agitated, you are to be uh, uh, depressed, you are to be sorry. You are to be uh, uh, aware and absolutely fearful of what's coming next. Woe to you that are at ease. In Zion. You see, uh, Samaria had conquered Moab and Gilead and part of Syria, and they were living pretty high on the hog, and they were pretty uh, secure in what they had accomplished. And uh, in verse 1, he says, You trust in the mountain of Samaria as if everything you have, you did it by yourself, and uh, you can depend on yourself, and you don't need anybody else. And, uh, and uh, so, woe to you in your easy living. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, there's nothing wrong with easy living in itself. I like it easier. The older I get, the easier I like it. Under Bible study note A, everybody works for, longs for, strives for an easy life. And that's called progress, isn't it? We used to have a man in the church from Marion who lived on Easy Street. I think it was 29 Easy Street. I always wanted to live on Easy Street because a lot of people, they talk about the good old days as if way back yonder was the good days. Well, I want to tell you, way back yonder for me weren't the good old days because when we have zero weather back then, we didn't have a nice little uh, thermostat to keep everything even. No, no, no. We had a little fireplace would go down and up and down and up, and we'd have uh, snow come in the window seals or even through the walls. We had a bathroom, but it was outdoors, <laughs> a single seat. I don't look at the old days, the good old days, as being that good. Today is a lot better. It's a lot easier. I was out taking care of my snow yesterday. I had a snowblower. Some of you people just want to do a shovel. That's all right. I like it easier. I like smart TVs. 
They're so smart. They just know how to make you feel cozy in the wintertime, and you don't have to go out. Well, here's what, here's the problem with that. It can lull you into a state of taking everything for granted. Amen? And that's the problem with easy living. There's nothing wrong with it in itself if it brings contentment and not complacency. Under Bible study note B, the difference between contentment and complacency is this. Contentment is being satisfied with what you have. You know, yeah, you want to work and you want to achieve more, but being satisfied with where, what you have, that you are absolutely pleased to be married to the woman or the man you're married to, that you're thrilled about the children you have even though they're not perfect, and you love your house and your refrigerator, especially your refrigerator. <laughs> you know, that's contentment. Complacency is the opposite. Complacency is being satisfied the way things are. And I want to tell you, things are not good. I mean, when we have five, over four to 5,000 people in our state that died on overdose to drugs this year, we had over a, I don't know how many, a record number of people murdered in our city this year. That's not good, and there's no way we can be satisfied with that. When we have people that are committing sexual assault at the workplace, sexual harassment, sexual uh, uh, abuse with little children, we can't be content with that. That's complacency. Church cannot be satisfied that way. Under C, contentment is being satisfied with, your lo uh, with God's love for you. He loved us so much, he gave his only son. 1 John 4.10 said, Hereby we know the love of God, that he loved us first and gave his son to be a propitiation for us. I said, you got to be satisfied with God's love for you. He loved you enough to give his only son. He loves you everlastingly. He loves you as if you're the only one in the world to love. Contentment is being satisfied with his love for you. Complacency is being satisfied with your love for God. Because the Bible says the first commandment, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might and all your strength. And I want to challenge you. Do you love God like that? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength? Few of us do. But here's the deal. Love is a living thing. It's either growing or it's dying. Amen? Your love for God is either going up, it's increasing, or it's diminishing. And that's the problem with complacency. You get to the place of status quo, and you love God, but you love him less and less because you don't love him more and more. That's complacency. And we can't tolerate that. God can't tolerate that. We can't afford to live that way. Amen? We're sort of like the fellow... Who, uh, whose wife asked him, said, honey, why don't you tell me you love me anymore? He said, well, honey, I told you I loved you once. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Some of us Christians live that way with God. Some of us act that way with God. Well, 40 years ago, he saved me, and I give him thanks for it. If he does anything else, I'll give him thanks for that. No, no, no. No, no, no. There's a tack on easy living. Because here's the thing. Just like Samaria... Prosperity, often, more times than not, maybe always, diminishes spirituality. We're a prosperous people. We have to be on guard for complacency. Amen? Because it will diminish our spirituality, it will decrease our love for God, and it will just get less and less and less. Let's appeal to our own hearts and say to ourselves, I'm going to refresh my uh, life. I'm going to renew my heart. I'm going to rededicate 
my life to Jesus and love God with all my heart. Let's consider that this morning. And if you do, give him praise. Now, the second attack, or the second wake-up call, is a warning to approaching danger. And this is what he says in verse 2. Go down to county and see. And from there, go over to Hamon, the great. And then go down to Gath of the Philistines. And consider, after you look at those cities, are you, are you any better than their kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? And then he gives you this woe again. Be fearful. Be alarmed. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who say that judgment is way off, we're doing good, but what you're doing is bringing judgment and destruction even closer. What were these three cities? They were the city of uh, Kalni in Babylon. They were the city of Hamath in Syria and Gath in Philistine. They had two things in common with Samaria. Their size, they were all large, and their pride, they were all proud. The difference was the other three cities had been destroyed. They lay in ashes. Samaria was vulnerable and would soon be destroyed by Assyria. Hear me. God wakes us up or gives us a wake-up call to warn us of approaching dangers. There's a lot of danger that's a, related to complacency. Under Bible study note A, complacency is the most dangerous thing you can imagine. I've known people who are complacent about their health. And they sacrifice their health because they're complacent. I've been with people who have died because they smoked themselves to death. I remember one lady I visited she had been warned and warned and warned by doctors, give up smoking. I sit in her living room and talk to her. She let, lit one cigarette off another cigarette, one after another, just a chain smoker. The last time I seen her, she was in the hospital in an iron lung. She smoked herself to death because she was complacent about her health. I've seen people drink themselves to death. My brother-in-law literally drank himself to death. Being complacent about his own health, he lost his life. I've been with people who ate themselves to death. Obesity, horrible thing. This is a warning of approaching danger. And listen, if we don't hear the wake-up call, we can lose our health, we can lose our life, we can lose our relationship with Jesus. Here's what 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 12 says. Therefore, let him who thinks, him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. You see, the thing about Samaria was they were proud of who they were. Their prosperity had bred, uh, bred a lack of spirituality and pride had increased and pride goes before a fall. We need to realize that complacency is a dangerous thing. We can't afford to have complacency in our home, in our family, in our workplace, in our church, in our community, in our country. We can lose everything we have, amen? We can lose our freedom, for goodness sake, if we're complacent. Under Bible study note B, the most dangerous thing toward your marriage is complacency. Because we don't quit loving each other, we just drift apart. We just drift apart. There, you don't wake up one day and say, I want a divorce. You don't wake up one day and say, you know, I'm going to move out. You don't wake up one day and just say, I don't love you anymore. No, 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 no. You just drift and drift and drift apart. You're complacent. 
about your relationship and you lose one of the most valuable things in the world. I've seen it happen and you have too. Time after time after time, people divorce because they just drift away. Adultery is not the number one uh, problem in, divo in divorce anymore. Neither is an affair. Neither is it pornography. The number one problem is we just drift, drift, drift away as if we have interest other things and we're not in common anymore. Listen, trouble, trouble in a marriage doesn't uh, uh, cause a marriage to dissolve. Trouble can actually bring you together if you address the problem. You can fight and it can bring you closer. Just fight fairly. Don't throw things. Don't use the divorce word. And, and, and you can argue and fuss and come together if you learn to fight fairly. Fighting unfairly is just sweeping things under the rug. And you know what happens then? You just drift apart. So researchers tell us how to avoid complacency in the marriage. One of the things they say is uh, that you should kiss often. I was hoping Colleen would agree with you. I don't know. My wife and I have been married 42 years, and her kisses still make my toes tingle. You liked that, didn't you? Kiss often. Find three, researchers say find three things you appreciate about your spouse and repeat it to them often. Just three things you appreciate. It will keep your marriage alive where you don't drift apart. You can't afford to be complacent about this thing because it's too, too, too valuable. Too valuable. Find three things you appreciate. I tell you, it's not hard. I tell my wife, honey, you, you know, you don't cook too well, but you have a good house. <laughs> I was just kidding. But some of you people do that kind of stuff. That is not an appreciation. You don't dig someone and then throw in an appreciation. So find three things you appreciate and repeat. And what researchers say is flirt with each other. Now, have you forgot how to do that? Flirt with each other. Gordy, you're looking at me like, I know how you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Richard, you like that, don't you? Researchers say you should have an affair with your spouse. What? Plan something where you get away, nobody knows. You know, my wife and I were, I, I don't want to tell this. <laughs> but the devil told me to do it. Uh, <laughs> we, we, were, we were out having uh, lunch, and I said, honey, why don't we just have lunch in Circleville, our favorite restaurants here, Captain D's. The only one I can afford and enjoy at the same time. I said, let's just have lunch in Circleville and stay all night and chill coffee. She said, we don't, we don't have any overnight bag. I said, we can go to Penny's or Macy's. She said, you know, that would be, that was one of the greatest overnight events we ever had. There's got to be ways. There's got to be ways you keep your marriage alive that you keep some excitement in it, that you have some unexpected uh, unexpectation, that you spend time together. Find things that you can do together and do them. Make sure you have an allowance somewhere in your date, somewhere in your calendar, somewhere in your schedule that you and your spouse are going to do some stuff, just you two, whatever they like. And then one researcher said, you need to hug each other eight times a day. Hug each other eight times a day. Or someone said, everyone needs a warm touch. A warm touch. Eight to 12 times a day. And this is not a touch, young man. You're doing good, old girl. That's not a touch. And then researchers say, you should spend time together, and you should tell each other you love each other and act like you mean it. 
act like you mean it. I heard one fellow, uh, his wife said, watching the neighbors next door hug and kiss, and she said, honey, why don't you ever do that? He said, well, I, I would, but she, she's his wife. <laughs> Listen, find ways to do it. Find ways to love each other and show that you mean it. And I'll tell you one of the things that's helped me. And I started doing this years ago. I pray for my wife every day. And there's a lot of people in this congregation I pray for every day. Some of you need it that don't get it, like Gerald. He needs it a lot. <laughs> but I pray for some people in this congregation every day, and I decided if I can do that for them, I can surely do it for my wife. And I pray for her every day that I can enjoy her more every day, encourage her more every day, love her more every day, and be more patient with her every day. And I want to tell you, ever since I've been praying that way, our marriage is going to the stars. Amen? We're going crazy. Going, and look how old I am. It's just getting better and better and better and better. Start praying for your spouse. Start showing you and telling you love each other and showing it. Amen? Because complacency will destroy your marriage. It, you will just drift apart. Complacency will destroy your relationship with God under Bible study note C. You'll just grow cold. Some of you are there now. Some of you are in church today because it's a habit not because it's a, a joyful experience. Some of us have already gr uh, gr grown cold. Now, how you grow cold? You just do the opposite of what I was talking about before. You don't spend time with God. You don't find things about God that you uh, appreciate, and you don't tell him you appreciate it. You don't just itemize a bunch of things, say, God, I thank you for this, I thank you for this, I thank you for this. And we grow cold because we start taking things for granted. We need to understand that uh, God wants us to wake up out of our sleep, out of our sl uh, slumber, out of our stupor, and give him praise for everything that he's done in our life to keep our relationship with God alive. There was a young man that came back from camp. He got up in front of the church and told everybody how excited he was about Jesus, how much he was in love with Jesus, and what Jesus had done for him at camp, and what Jesus is doing for him in his life right now. Someone in the back was overheard saying, he'll get over it. God, help us not to get over what God has done for us. Think of what he's done for you and start praising him. And then go with him. Go with him where he goes. Go to feed my sheep. He's down there feeding sheep and taking care of the lambs. Go down to Stowe Center and feed some people. Go where God is. Spend some time with where God is and do things together. You can't afford to be complacent and lose your relationship with God. One of the problems is with dead churches is they just have lost their joy. They lost their praise. They lost their worship. Bob Huffaker told me 30 years ago when he came to the Nazarene church, it was the deadest church in the world. He said, we had a person had a heart attack in our church and died, and they called 911, and they picked up three people before they got the right one. That's a dead church. We can't afford to have a dead church or dead people. But complacency will kill your relationship with Christ. Amen? Number three, the third wake-up call is uh, an indictment for insensitivity. Now, you will follow me here, and then I'll close. In verse four, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches. Now, think about this. We're talking about the richest people in Samaria. And by the way, the uh, prophecy is to the rich, to the rulers, and to the leaders. But I want you to identify how we live today according to these rich leaders back then. They lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches. My daughter bought a couch the other day. 
that goes all around one side of her living room, around the back side, and got all these little automatic things on, goes zip, 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 zip. <laughs> it's amazing the couches we have and the recliners we have that are so similar to the people in Samaria. And you eat lambs from your flock, lamb chops like a prize dish, calves, veal, young veal, young calves, prize meat. I mean, few of you eat it, tell the truth. Few of you eat at Captain D's. Most of you eat Roadhouse or Longhorn, Olive Garden. Come on. These people and you are very similar. You invent for yourself musical instruments like David. How many of you got Pandora and all the channels you want and you can listen to them anywhere you want with, uh, with your Bluetooth? Come on. Some of you wear Bluetooth in here, and I don't know if you're waiting on a telephone call, God to call you out, or you listen to your favorite station. I just don't know. Who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best ointments and soak in their hot tubs. How many of you got hot tubs? Just tell the truth. I do. I've had it for 20 years. I soak in it almost every day. But here's the problem. The problem is not with the prosperity. The problem is with verse 6. You're not grieved with the affliction of Joseph. You're not sensitive to the poverty, to the injustice, to the brokenness, to the sickness, the lostness, and the dying of people all around you. That doesn't afflict you. You're not sensitized to it because of all the things you have to take care of yourself, to give you pleasure, to give you uh, uh, some sort of honor to yourself, makes you insulated from those people outside of you. Under Bible study note A, their compassion had dried up. They had no compassion for the drug addicts. They had no compassion for the homeless. They had no compassion for those in the hospital, those in the nursing home, those that were sick and dying. They had no compassion on the needs of those around them. And he's asking, do you hear God saying to you, wake up, pay attention. These people need you. And here's the other thing, you need them. Under Bible study, don't be. The problem we have with our compassion for people is a bigger problem we know. You see, it's not just we're cheating them because they're not getting our help. The problem is we're cheating ourselves. We need them. God has made us the kind of people that if we don't reach out and help other people, we hurt ourselves. Dr. Carl Minninger, one of the most famous psychiatrists of all time, one time was asked this question. What would you prescribe a person if they told you they were going to have a nervous breakdown? Have you ever had a nervous breakdown? Have you ever come close? Colleen said you had a couple last week, Gerald. I don't know. What would a, what would a noble noble, professional psychiatrist like Carl Minninger prescribed someone that was going to have a nervous breakdown. Surely some great medicine, something that would just uh, so, uh, settle your nerves. We always want to take something for our nerves. Carl Minninger said, I would tell them to lock their door, get out of the house, Go down the road and find someone that had more trouble, more problems than they had, and help them. And you know what that would do? In helping them would help themselves. You and I, we're not afflicted by the, uh, uh, we're not uh, uh, sensitive and compassionate to the affliction of Joseph. We're hurting ourselves. We're not just hurting the homeless and the, and the dying and the lonely and the sick. We're hurting ourselves. We need to be involved in their lives. 
I tell you, we, we're blessed to have pastors on our staff visit the hospital, and I thank God for their visits. But I tell you, they're not going to keep me from going to the hospital. Them people may not need me, but I need to be involved in their lives. I've never visited a sick person that it didn't help me more than it helped them. You follow me? So Amos is saying, God roars out of Zion. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up or you're going to lose. You're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your life. You're going to lose your spouse. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your relationship with God. You've got to wake up. When I was in junior high, which was a few decades ago, junior high, I was one of the most complacent, apathetic, worthless kids in class. I had no motivation to learn. I had three teachers in junior high that were convinced they were going to wake me up. One was Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens had a way to wake me up. I'd try to sit in the back, hide so I could daydream, doodle, uh, just do anything but pay attention. And Mr. Stevens would be all the way at the front, and he'd take an eraser or a piece of chalk, and he would wing that thing right at me. And if it missed, I just heard the whiz and the bang against the wall. Otherwise, bam. That woke me up for 10 or 15 minutes. Mr. Stevens never quit. And every now and then, he'd use his yardstick. And he'd sneak up on my desk and bam, hit that desk. Woo! And if he wanted to, he'd just hit me. You know, we didn't have any problem with teachers beating on kids back then. <laughs> they just beat on them. So I had another teacher named Mr. Plymouth. Mr. Plyman was a little older. He was a girly kind of man. He was so dainty, you wouldn't think he would hurt a fly. I thought I could get by with anything. I would just be daydreaming, doodling, whatever I want to do. He'd come up behind me, get in front of my desk, and look at me in the face. When I looked up, he'd go, bam, right up against my face, hard as he could. And even though he was dainty, he could hit hard. And I would carry his handprint all day long. Several days, several weeks, I had Mr. Plymouth laying his hand right upside my head. That ain't right. It woke me up for 10, 15 minutes. We had another teacher in junior high. His name was Mr. Love. Don't be confused with the name. He was five foot tall, five foot wide. His arms were huge. He had been around a long time. My older brothers had Mr. Love in class. And they told me stories about Mr. Love. How he would hit boys and knock them up against the wall. And maybe they'd bounce off one wall to another wall. He'd take some boys and just take them. He never did girls this way, but he did boys this way. He'd just take them and hang them on a nail where you put your coat. And just hang them there with their belt. And leave him as long as he wanted to leave him, just there with a wedgie. Just leave him there. Just leave him there. Well, Mr. Love was out of teaching for a long time. Uh, but fortunately, before I got to junior high, he came back. He was out on a medical leave. He was in a mental institution for several years. Mr. Love was one mean dude. And I, I had seen a lot of his things. One time, I seen him out on the playground one day separate two big boys fighting. These were two boys that had been held back three or four years. And so in junior high, they were about 18, 19. And they were fighting. And I seen Mr. Love walk right into it and pick him up by the seat of the pants. Bam! And I didn't know if they were going to hit the ground. Man, I'm telling you, he could do it all. He was huge. You didn't mess with Mr. Love. He was like a Dwayne Johnson, only shorter. Mr. Love had a way of waking me up. Because of who he was and what I knew about him, you know how Mr. Love woke me up? He'd say, Jerry. I said, what? <laughs> he said, don't you think you should say, yes, I am. I'm going to study. That's all he had to say. You know, it was just a, just a soft voice because he was such a big man and he had such an authority over me. 
He woke me up. I got through junior high. But there wasn't anybody who kept me awake through high school. I was determined. I got out of high school. I'd never go to school another day in my life. And then God woke me up. In his way, God spoke to me. Like Amos said, God roars. I want to tell you, I was in a stupor. I had no appreciation for people. I had no appreciation for myself. I just want to live for myself, get out of school, and be a bum, I guess. I had no direction. When God spoke to me and woke me up, I went to college. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Not only did I go to college, I went to seminary. Not only did I go to seminary, but the thing that was the furthest from anybody's mind with me in school was I became a pastor. People said, you're a pastor? I pastored a church in my hometown where kids that went to school with me came. They just wanted to make sure it was true, that I was really a prep pastor. Some of them got saved. I would have never went to college. I never went to seminary. I never went to, uh, to be a pastor. I never met you guys. I would have never met any of you people had God not spoke to me and woke me up. And the roar, the roar, the roar that Amos talked about was real, just a small, still voice. A small, still voice. Elijah went out to hear from God, and there was an earthquake. He didn't hear from God in the earthquake. There was a fire. He didn't hear from God in the fire. There was a whirlwind. He didn't hear from God in the whirlwind. He heard from God in a small, still voice. God speaking to you today just like he did to the people of Samaria. He's speaking to you, not through a prophet, but he's speaking to you by a small, still voice. Here's what he's saying. He's convicting you. He's convicting you and condemning you for some of the things you've been doing. Some of the places you've been going. Some of the things your mouth has been saying. Gossip. Cursings. Talking evil to, about other people. He's condemning you. And he's convicting you about where you've been talking, where you've been going, what you've been doing, the pictures you've been seeing, pornography. His still, small voice is convicting you right now. He's convicting you about growing cold. And his soft, small voice, he's saying, I'd rather for you be hot or cold, because if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He's speaking to you right now. Will you respond? Will you come and repent? Will you come and return to God? Will you come and cry out to God and say, Lord, help me to be refreshed. Help me to be renewed. Help me to be revived. I don't want my love to grow colder. I want it to grow hotter. Will you come and pray that way? Some of us have got loved ones that's really hurting. I went to the hospital and seen... Jeff Heiler, who has mad cow disease. They run all the tests. It takes away your mind. It takes away any possibility of cure. We have people like that around us that need our prayers because God hears and answers prayer. And if you have someone in your heart that's really in trouble physically or spiritually or some of your neighbors or friends or family that are lost, listen. Bring it to the Lord. Let's allow God to bring revival into our hearts this morning. Okay? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We pray, God, that you'll speak to us now in ways that we cannot ignore. We can turn off the preacher. We can turn off the prophet. We can shut the Bible. We can walk away. But we can't ignore that small, still voice speaking to our heart. We need to break the crisis of complacency. And we need to wake up and draw near to you. While we have time, while we have opportunities to save our health, to save our lives, to save our marriages, to save our families, to save our church, to save our own souls, help us to come to you now. If you're here and you've never been a Christian, this is the time to come and pray. We'll pray with you to receive Christ as your personal Savior. You come.
as others come to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're praying, and those that we're praying for, Lord, visit their hearts, visit their home, visit their work, visit their hospital. And Father, I pray that you minister in the name of Jesus and answer the prayers of your people. God, give us more courage to pray and more confidence to pray and more uh, reasons to pray and more opportunities to see prayers answered than ever before. Now in the name of our Father and the Son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, God be with you now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.